Welcome to the second part of example 5.4.1, so part B. So we're asked once again to find, if possible, the inverse of the given matrix. So just like we did earlier, let's use the method that we wrote to find the inverse, which is to first write the augmented matrix AI, which is simply the matrix uh, that's given, and we augment it by writing the identity matrix next to it. And the last row, 0, 0, 1. So this is matrix AI. And we proceed to put it into RREF using the gauss jordan algorithm. So as, just as we did in the previous example, I'll do row 2 plus row 1 becomes row 2. And row 3 plus 3 row 1 becomes row 3. That will give us our new matrix. Row 1 we haven't changed, so I'll just recopy it. Row 2 becomes 0. 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and row 3, 3 minus 3, 0, 4, 4, 3, 0, 1. We've completed the matrix. A couple more steps. We can do in the same step minus row 1 becomes row 1, and row 3 minus 4 row 2 becomes the new row 3. So applying those two operations, we get 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 0, 3, minus 4, negative 1, minus 4, and 1. And that is our third matrix. And as you can see, we're going to stop right here, because what do you notice happened on the left? We have this row of zeros. Right? But this row of zeros means, and in particular because of this position, this means that this position can never become, no matter what we do next, this cannot, I'm going to write it here, cannot become a 1. Right? So if this cannot become a 1, then the matrix on the left can never become the identity matrix. And therefore, if we look back at the procedure, it says if you don't get i on the left, then you can stop and simply state that a is singular, not invertible. Okay, so we'll write it here. I'll say, therefore, A is not row equivalent to I, and therefore, A is singular. A is singular, or you can simply state that A inverse does not exist. So these are two ways of saying the same thing. And that is what happens in the cases where the matrix A is not invertible. Okay, so just a couple of remarks on what we've just seen. So you notice when we did part A of this exercise, we used the fact that if A is row equivalent to I, then A is invertible. It's invertible. But in this part of the exercise, in part B, we used that if A is not row equivalent to I, then A is singular. I want to remind you or attract your attention to the fact that we proved the first statement, right? We proved it in the last section, but we have not proven the second statement, that if A is not Brooklyn tie, then A is singular. Nonetheless, it's a true statement, and another way of stating it would be to say that if A is invertible, if A is invertible, then A is Brooklyn tie. Okay, this is actually the same, the same statement, um, these two statements, if A is not equivalent to I, then A is singular. If you think about it, another way of saying this is that if A is invertible, then it must be equivalent to I. Okay, these two statements are the same statement. And what we're going to show, and this will be part of the invertibility theorem that we'll see in a in the, uh, couple of next sections, uh, what we'll see is that both these statements are true, and so you could sum that up by saying that A is invertible, is invertible if and only if, only if, a is row equivalent to I. Okay, so if and only if, as you know, is a way of giving a what's called a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay, so it's another way of showing that the implication is true in both directions. If A is row equivalent to I, then A is invertible, and if A is invertible, then A is row equivalent to I. So we'll stop here, and we'll pick up on this thought in the section.